Unit One. Take a break. Listening. Exercises four, five, and six. Conversation one. You look exhausted. Oh, yes, I've just come off the court. Did you win? Yes, finally. But my opponent was very strong. The match went to three sets. Oh, well done. Conversation two. When did you learn to play? When I was a child, my grandfather taught me the moves when I was only six years old. I never get bored. Every game's a new challenge. Really? Yes. We used to play every Sunday afternoon. He loved it. It must have helped to keep his mind active. Conversation three. It looks like a really tough sport. I don't know how you do it. Oh, I love it. But you've got to be a good swimmer. I wouldn't want to be the goalkeeper. Yes, that's hard. We usually put our very best player in goal. It looks exhausting. Conversation four. Don't you ever get bored? No, never. I just love sitting here by the river, doing nothing. It's so relaxing. Do you ever catch anything? No, not often. But that doesn't matter. It's not for me, I'm afraid. I need something a bit more interesting. Conversation five. People often think it's a hobby for old people, but I love it. It's very satisfying seeing things grow. Yes, but we live in an apartment. You can grow things in pots and window boxes, you know. You don't need a lot of space. Perhaps I should give it a try. Yes, you might find you have green fingers after all. Conversation six. Would you like to join us for dinner on Saturday? Oh, thanks, but I can't. I need to be ready for the marathon on Sunday. Oh, okay. What distance do you have to cover? Twenty-six miles. So I'll need to be in bed early. Twenty-six miles? That makes me feel tired just thinking about it. Conversation seven. Are you enjoying the latest Harry Potter novel? Oh, it's great! It's really exciting. I can't put it down. I thought the film was better myself. I haven't seen the film yet. Actually, I usually find I prefer the book to the film, but not this time. Unit one, listening, exercise seven. Good morning. Today on Hobby Horse, we'll be hearing about some unusual hobbies. Maybe you had a hobby when you were a child, such as collecting model cars or painting or drawing. But not many of us continue with these hobbies into our adult life. John Shipley is an exception, however. He's on the line to tell us about his rather unusual hobby that has taken him to high places. Hello. Tell us. When did you first become interested in planes?、Um, when I was about seven years old, I've always loved the idea of flying. And、um, what kind of planes do you fly? Very light planes called microlights. What age must you be before you can take up flying a microlight?、Uh, you must be at least fourteen to have lessons.、Uh, you do this with an instructor, but you can't go solo. That's flying on your own until you're fifteen. What is it that you like so much about this leisure activity? It sounds like it could be quite dangerous. Oh,、um, lots of things.、Um, sense of freedom, being able to get away from everything. But I think most of all, it's the excitement. Yes, it must be fantastic being up in the air like that. It's like being a bird. There's nothing else like it. Unit one, IELTS speaking test model, part one. After you have introduced yourself and the examiner has checked your ID, he or she will ask you questions on three topic areas. The first topic area will be about your studies, your work, or where you live. Let's talk about your hometown. Where were you born?、Um, I was born、um, in a place called Rochester in the Medway Towns in Kent. Do you still live in Rochester? No, I haven't lived in Rochester for a long time now. Since I went to college, I live in London. Do most people like living in Rochester?、Um, I guess they do.、Um, I, I, I always wanted to live in London, so my family still live there. But I guess it's a nice place. Why?、Uh, 
Uh, well, it's got beautiful architecture and uh, it's the home of Dickens and so there's quite a lot of historical interest there and um, you've got countryside nearby and it's easily accessible for London. Do you think you'll stay in London? Oh, I don't know. I I've been here for quite a while now and although I love it, I can't imagine spending my whole life here. The next two topics will be more general. I'd like to move on to talk about sport. What's your favourite sport? My favourite sport to watch is football, but to participate in, um, it's swimming. When did you first become interested in swimming? Um, gosh, um, when I was a child, uh, my dad used to take me swimming uh, every week and um, I swam for my school. How often do you participate in swimming now? I try to swim at least two times a week. What equipment do you need for swimming? The great thing is that you don't really need any equipment apart from goggles and trunks. Where do you go swimming? Um, anywhere I am. I love swimming in the sea, but mainly I swim at my local pool. Now, let's move on to talk about shopping. How do you feel about going shopping? Um, I don't mind going shopping. Um, I like to know exactly what I'm going shopping for, though. I like to uh, get in, buy it and go home again. Do you like buying clothes or goods on the internet? I've never bought clothes on the internet because I like to try them on before buying them, but I've certainly bought um, electrical goods and other things on the internet. What don't you like about shopping? Um, I don't really like big crowds of people and fighting my way through them to get what I want, and um, I guess I don't like paying for it all. Unit 2. What's on the menu? Speaking. Exercise 2. I don't like vegetables and I really hate cabbage. I'm afraid I can't stand cream or anything that's made with it. Don't you think cold coffee's really horrible? Unit 2. Speaking. Exercise 3. I love eating vegetables, especially cabbage. I really like cream and anything that's made with it. I adore iced coffee. It's delicious. Unit 2. Speaking. Exercise 4. I'm afraid I just don't eat meat. I just don't eat cheese at all. I can't stand the smell of fish. I just love the taste of ice cream. I hate what toffee does to my teeth. I just really like sweet things. Unit 2. Listening. Exercise 2. Conversation 1. Are you ready to order, sir? Yes, I'd like the steak, but can I have salad instead of chips? Of course. Anything to drink? Just water, please. Fine. It'll be about 15 minutes, I'm afraid. One of our chefs is off sick. Oh, don't worry. Conversation 2. I'm starving. I think I'll get in the queue for the hot food today. I'll just have a sandwich. I'll be cooking tonight. Here's a tray. Thanks. Shall we go and sit with Bob and Tina at their table? OK. It's pretty busy in here today. Conversation three. Mmm. This curry's delicious, isn't it? Yes. And the onion dish really adds to the flavour. Let's ask Mary for the recipe when she comes out of her kitchen. Good idea. Conversation four. Have you got a menu? Yes, here you are. Sweet and sour pork is off. OK. We'll have fried prawns, beef and chilli sauce and steamed rice. There's a 15-minute wait. OK. We'll come back later to collect it. Conversation 5. Now I've got sausages, steaks and kebabs. Anything else? That's it. Do you think it's enough for 12 people? Oh, sure. There's plenty of salad to go with it. Is the fire hot enough yet? I think so. What shall we cook first? 
Conversation six. I don't feel very hungry at the moment. Never mind. Eat what you can. It would taste much better if it wasn't wrapped in plastic. Just pretend you're at home. I wish I was. I hate travelling. Conversation seven. Now, where did I put the lemons that I bought yesterday? Here they are, Nick. Oh, thanks. Oh dear, they aren't very juicy. Do you want me to go and get some more? Yes, please. Our guests will be here in half an hour, and I need to finish this dessert. Unit two, listening, exercise three. I went out for dinner last night, cause my aunt and my cousin had come to see me for the evening, so I decided to take them out. I was going to take them to my favourite Italian cafe, yes, the Napoli, but it was fully booked. So we ended up eating at the new Japanese restaurant near the city centre. Yes, that's the one. It was really nice inside, and they had several set menus at a variety of prices. Yes, well, the one we chose was very good value for money. Well, my aunt ordered soup, and Martin, my cousin, had chicken. Yes, and I chose the sashimi, you know, raw fish. I'd never eaten that before, but I quite liked it. It has a very delicate flavour. My cousin had beer, but my aunt and I had tea. Unit three, on the road, listening, exercise six, conversation one. What kind of bag have you got? It's a rucksack.、Um, is it that small pink rucksack over there? No, mine's yellow with a front pocket, and it should have my sleeping bag tied onto the top. I hope they haven't lost it. Oh, good, there it is. Conversation two. Mum, Mum, I can see our cases coming now. Can you? Where are they? Over there. Look. They're all coming through together. You get the small one, and I'll grab the other two. Conversation three. I can't believe it takes this long to get the bags off the plane. Just be patient, dear. They'll arrive in a minute. Yeah, there's my green briefcase. But no sign of my bags. No. Isn't that your brown suitcase coming through now? No. Can't see it anywhere. Conversation four. There's your bag, Chris. Can you grab it? No, Dad. That's not our bag. Ours is black, not brown, and it's bigger than that. Oh, you're right. They all look so similar, don't they? Ah,、uh, I can see it. It's coming now. Conversation five. Oh, at last, they've started loading the bags from our flight. Here they come. Look at that dirty old suitcase with all the stickers on it. That person has done some travelling. Yeah, that's my bag actually. Oh, really? Conversation six. Excuse me, would you mind grabbing my suitcase for me? Sure. What does it look like? It's that one there, the large red suitcase with the two yellow straps round the outside. <laughs> there you are. Thanks so much. Not a problem. Unit three. Step up to IELTS listening. Questions one to five. Yes, can I help you? Two of my bags seem to be missing.、Uh, where were you coming from, madam? From London via Bangkok. Okay,、uh, I'll have to get you to fill out this form. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't have my glasses with me. Would you mind reading it to me? Right.、Um, can I have your name, please, madam? Greenleaf, Mrs. Mary Greenleaf. That's G R E E N L E A F. Address? Here or in the UK? We live in Manchester.、Uh, here in Sydney. Where are you staying? We're staying at the International Hotel. And the phone number there?、Uh, I'll give you my husband's mobile number. It's 
Uh, right. And which flight were you on? Flight QF2. Uh, that's the flight from Bangkok, isn't it? Well, we stopped briefly in Bangkok, but the bags were loaded in the UK. We've come through from London. And what date did you board the flight? We left London yesterday. That was the 31st of July. OK. Departed 31st July. Uh, two bags, you said? Yes, that's right. Unit 3. Step up to IELTS listening. Questions 6 to 10. Now, what sort of bags are we looking for? Well, there's one that has all my makeup in it and... Can uh, you give me a thorough description of it, madam? Yes, it's a small square case made of blue plastic. And does it have your name on it anywhere? Not anywhere visible. I think my name is written inside. Right. And... Does it have a handle of any sort? Yes, it's got a handle on top. Oh, that's useful. It'll help us find it. Um, OK. And the other one? Well, that's a suitcase. It's a medium-sized brown leather suitcase. Brown leather, you said? Yes. Does it have a strap round it or anything? No. Uh, but it's got its own wheels. Suitcase with wheels. You know... This has never happened to me before. I hope they turn up. Oh, uh, they always turn up, madam. Chances are they'll be on the next flight in from Bangkok. Unit 3. IELTS Test Practice. Section 1. You will hear a telephone conversation in which a student is inquiring about the cost of accommodation. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. you will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning, East Coast Backpackers. Oh, hi. I'd like some information, please. Yes, sure. How much does it cost to stay at your hostel? Well, if you stay in the bunkhouse, it's $5.90 a night. That's sharing with five other people. The cost of the bunkhouse is $5.90 a night, so $5.90 has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good morning, East Coast Backpackers. Oh, hi. I'd like some information, please. Yes, sure. How much does it cost to stay at your hostel? Well, if you stay in the bunkhouse, it's $5.90 a night. That's sharing with five other people. Right. Do you have anything else? We didn't really want to share with that many people. Sure. We've got cabins for $11 a night. Or if you want air conditioning, then they're $14. So... The cabins with air conditioning are $14. Correct. OK. Are you right on the beach? It's a five-minute walk to the beach, and we also have a swimming pool. What about diving? Can you do any scuba diving? Sure, and we offer a special package for diving. Great. I'll get back to you. Hello, Emu Park Hostel. Oh, hi. I'm just inquiring about the cost of staying at your hostel. Well, we've got a number of levels of accommodation. 
If you share with up to five others, it'll cost you five dollars a night or thirty dollars a week. Do you have any individual rooms? Yeah, we do. We've got rooms overlooking the beach with their own bathroom. How much are the rooms with the bathroom? Thirty dollars a night, but we're booked out for the rest of the month. Oh, I see. And is it possible to scuba dive? I mean, are there any diving facilities? Not here, I'm afraid. But it's great for fishing. Okay, not too keen on fishing. Thanks. I might leave it then. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions seven to ten. Now listen and answer questions seven to ten. Hello, East Coast backpackers. Oh hi, it's Sabina Toma here again. I called you earlier. Oh yes, I remember. I'd like to make a reservation, if that's possible, for the bunkhouse. Fine. What dates were you looking at? Well, from today, if possible, for about a week. Oh, okay. Well, you're in luck because some people have just left this morning. Can you give me the exact address, please? Okay. Well, it's the Backpackers Hostel, Shute Harbour Road. That's S H U T E, and another word, Harbour, which is spelled H A R B O U R. Shute Harbour Road. Okay, got it. And how do we get there from the town? We'll be arriving by coach. Well, you'll need to take a local bus. Catch the number twenty-five to the beach. It will have the words "Golden Sands" on the front of the bus. Right. Let me just write that down. Golden Sands. Just ask for the backpackers' hostel, but it's only about two kilometers from the center of town, so you could walk it. I think we'll get the bus. Oh, and one last thing: Do you have access to the internet? Yes, we've got a little internet cafe here with five computers, so you can send and receive emails. And how much does it cost to use the computers? That'll cost you four dollars an hour, and we serve great coffee too. So, is there a little shop where we can buy things? Yes, we sell a few essential things, you know, soap and toothpaste, that sort of thing. Thanks. That sounds perfect. We'll see you this evening. Right, Sabina. We'll see you then. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Unit five, come rain or shine. Listening, exercise two. And welcome to today's phone in. So let's go to our first caller, who is Jane. Good morning, Jane. Good morning. Now we've been having our fair share of rain this month. How do you feel about this wet weather? Oh, it's great. I love the rain. Oh, really? Why is that, Jane? Well, I just love the sound of it on the window, especially when I'm tucked up in bed. It makes me feel safe and secure. And do you have a musical request this morning? Yes, I'd like to hear Stormy Monday Blues. Okay, Jane. Stormy Monday Blues coming up. <laughs> And our next caller is Bruno. Are you there, Bruno? Hi. Bruno, where are you calling from? Melbourne. The line's not very clear, mate. That's because I'm calling on my mobile and I'm stuck in the traffic. What do you think of this weather we've been having? Oh, it's terrible. It's driving me mad. 
The traffic's always worse when it rains. Well, we need it, you know. Yeah, but not this much. OK, so what would you like to hear this morning? So, Bruno didn't think much of this weather. Let's take another call. Mary. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Where are you calling from, Mary? From a property in the far west of Victoria. We're on a sheep farm here. And what do you think of this rain? Oh, it's marvellous. It's been dry as a bone here for months. We desperately needed the rain. We haven't seen decent rain for over two years. Yes, it's terrible for the farmers when there's a long drought. But that's a familiar pattern in the bush. Too much rain or not enough. Let's play a little song about the rain. Let's take another call. And this time it's Liz from the suburb of Carlton in Melbourne. Hello? Are you enjoying all this rain we're having in Melbourne? No, I can't stand it. I much prefer the sunshine. Why is that, Liz? It's good for the garden. Yes, but when it rains this much, you get soaked going to school and then you have to spend the whole day sitting around in wet clothes. Have you thought of taking an umbrella or a raincoat? Oh, no. I couldn't use an umbrella. You look so stupid carrying an umbrella. No, I'd rather get wet. OK, Liz. And what would you like us to play for you today? Unit 5. Listening. Exercise 4. OK, so let's go to our first caller. Hello. And what's your name? And where are you calling from? And what's the weather like there today? Is it? And do you like that kind of weather? OK. And what would you like us to play for you today? Unit 5. Listening. Exercise 6. Well, with all this rain about, we thought we'd do a bit of research into the origin of umbrellas. Where did umbrellas come from and why were they introduced? Let's go over to our resident specialist, Kerry McCall. What have you got for us on umbrellas, Kerry? Quite a bit, actually, John. Well, the English word umbrella comes from the Latin word umbra which means shade. This is because the original umbrellas weren't used to protect you from the rain, but they were used to protect you from the sun in hot climates such as India, Egypt and China. Carrying an umbrella was seen as a sign that you were an important person. Ordinary people were expected to bake in the sun. Umbrellas were introduced into Europe by the ancient Greeks to keep them cool but it was the Romans who first thought to use them to keep themselves dry. Perhaps there wasn't very much rain in ancient Greece. <clears throat> Not like here, eh? There isn't much information available on umbrellas throughout the Middle Ages, but by the late 1500s, we see umbrellas being used again in Italy. As in earlier days, we find the important people using umbrellas, because having an umbrella reflected your... your position in society. But by the 1600s, umbrellas were common in France, and a century later, they were everywhere in Europe. In 1850, the traditional umbrellas, which were made out of cane, were replaced with umbrellas with a steel frame. Because they were stronger, this meant that they could also be much bigger, and we see the first of the really large man-size umbrellas, big enough for two people. In modern English, the word umbrella usually indicates something you would use to keep yourself dry rather than cool. But we do also talk about a beach umbrella, which is obviously not to protect you from the rain, but the unbearable rays of the beating sun. Unit 6. Value for money. Listening. Exercise 3. Speaker 1. You may think that people's spending doesn't change very much over the year. 
But as you can see from this graph, it does vary. There are two distinct periods when we spend more, and that's in the second and fourth quarters of the year. You see these two peaks. Otherwise, the pattern is fairly stable. Speaker two. There are always fluctuations in our staff absentee rate. It's often affected by viruses that go round the office, coughs and colds, that sort of thing. They result in periods when a lot of staff may be off at the same time. Over the first four months of this year, for example, the figures show that considerably more staff were off sick in January. That's a bad time for illness, but their numbers gradually declined. And in April, we had almost no one absent from work. Speaker three. And what about trade? As you can see from this graph, our data shows that between 1997 and 2000, China's international trade levels rose dramatically in comparison with global trade, which showed steady but less significant growth. Unit six. Listening. Exercise four. So let's have a look at how the company has done over the year. This graph compares sales for most of our holiday destinations. As you can see, sales of cruise holidays to Canada and the U.S. did moderately well. They fluctuated throughout most of the year. Then there was a slight dip towards the end of the year. However. This sector ended the year at an all-time high. After a disappointing start, interest in our European package holidays increased in February, and continued this trend, peaking in May. After that, there was a slight fall, after which sales stabilised for some time. Unfortunately, the last two months of the year saw a dramatic drop in sales. Now, our biggest growth area last year was South America. Sales of holidays to places like Brazil and Argentina rose rapidly in the first half of the year, and even though they levelled off mid-year, the sector remained stable until the end of the year. For some reason, the number of long-haul flights to Pacific Rim destinations plummeted at the start of the year. Then things hit a fairly low plateau until August, at which time they underwent a steep rise, ending the year at quite a high point. Lastly, India was a popular tourist destination, and flight sales rose in the first few months of the year. However, this situation didn't last, and sales fell rather dramatically after that. This trend stabilised towards the end of the year, however, and there are signs that it will improve next year. Unit seven, ignorance is bliss. Speaking, exercise one. Attended. Played. Kept. A. I expected the repairs to take two days, but they fixed the car straight away. Thank goodness! So you arrived in time for the wedding after all. B. The waiter bumped into the table, and then spilled the drinks all over one of the customers. It was hilarious. And I suppose everybody in the restaurant laughed. C. George promised to pick me up on time. But then, as usual, he turned up late. But you enjoyed the evening, didn't you? Unit eight, fit as a fiddle, listening, exercise four, conversation one. Gee, what have you done to yourself? Oh, it's too stupid for words. I hit my toe with a hammer. Oh, that must have really hurt. What does it feel like now? It feels like a bad burn. It's agony. Oh, you poor old thing. Conversation two. I can't believe anyone would actually do that. Yeah, it does seem pretty stupid, doesn't it? But I suppose young children are capable of anything, 
and their fingers are just small enough to fit into a PowerPoint. They can get a lethal shock, you know. It's extremely dangerous and very painful. Conversation three. Come in, Mrs. Johnson. What can I do for you this evening? Well, Doctor, I think I've slipped a disc in my back or something.、Mm. How did you manage that? Well, I bent down to pick up a box at work, and then I just couldn't move, couldn't stand up.、Mm. And、uh, what does it feel like now? Well, I can just about walk, but it feels very stiff.、Mm. Conversation four. Are you okay, Jack? Not really. That big bloke, number seven on the other team, he tripped me up and I fell on my elbow. If I try to move my arm, it really hurts. Let's get you off the field and have a look. Hmm. It looks as if you may have actually broken it. Yeah, it feels as if I have. It's killing me. Conversation five. Come in, Mr. Fielder. Hello, Mrs. Marks. Now, Mr. Fielder, as you know, all accidents at work have to be reported to the supervisor. So, can you tell me exactly how this injury occurred? Well, I slipped. You see, the floor must have been wet or something, and my ankle gave way, and I just went flying. And where did this happen? In the corridor, outside the men's toilets. Any serious injury? Well, I've twisted my ankle and. There's some swelling. It's pretty sore. Conversation six. <coughs> You're sneezing a lot today. Yes, I think it's hay fever, and I've got a sore throat.、Mm, either that, or your immune system is weak. Yes, I feel a bit rough. Maybe I should take some vitamin pills. Good idea. More vitamin C is what you need. You should look after yourself. Unit Eight, IELTS Speaking Test Model, Part Two. The examiner will introduce Part Two by saying, "Now I'm going to give you a topic, and I'd like you to talk about it for one to two minutes. Before you talk, you'll have one minute to think about what you're going to say. You can make some notes if you wish. Do you understand?" "Yes, I do." Then the examiner will give you some paper and a pencil for making notes, and read the topic to you. I'd like you to describe a minor accident that you had in the past. After your one-minute preparation time, you will give your talk. Um, when I was about seven, I was very ill after school, and、uh, I was sent home from school, and I was lying on the sofa feeling sorry for myself,、um, watching TV, and I got bored and decided to go and ask my mum if she could go and find a game for me or a book or something else to do. And when I went into the kitchen, my mother was cooking, and so as I sort of went behind her, I had no shoes on, and she didn't hear me coming. And she was making boiled potatoes, and as I got behind her, she turned around with the boiled potatoes in the saucepan to take them to the sink, and I was right behind her. So she hit me round the head with the saucepan of boiling water, and it all spilled down onto my shoulder, and splattered my face, and.、Um, Went all over my shoulder and burnt me,、um, but because she didn't let go of the saucepan, she still had it in her hand.、Um, she didn't realise that I was crying because I was burnt. She thought I was crying because she'd hit me and bumped my head, so she didn't respond quickly enough, which made the whole thing worse. At the time, my dad was a plumber. And of course, that was before mobile phones were invented. So Dad was out at work, and Mum didn't drive. So I had to wait about seven hours on the sofa with a dressing on my shoulder for my Dad to come home from work, so that he could take me to hospital. My poor Mum, bless her heart, must have been very worried and not knowing what to do、um, with not being able to drive. But I guess there, there wasn't anything else. She could do. She did as much as she could.、Um, bathed it in cold water. Put a dry dressing on. Thank you. Now we've been talking about Unit Eight. Step up to IELTS listening. Questions one to six. Good afternoon, everyone. 
We're delighted to welcome today a representative from the Red Cross, Mr. John Francis, who is going to talk to us about the work of the organization and about some basic aspects of first aid. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bloom. Well, I'd like to start by giving you some background and then talk about what you would learn on one of our courses. Uh, is everyone familiar with the work of the Red Cross? Um, well, the Red Cross movement was started by a man called Jean-Henri Dunon, who was a businessman from Switzerland. His interest in the uh, condition of innocent people caught up in war began in 1859, when he witnessed the effects of a very grim battle in Italy. Um, at the time, he organised all the villages to help the wounded soldiers and make sure they had food and basic medical attention. Um, a few years later, in 1864, the same gentleman, together with four Swiss colleagues, organised a conference which laid the foundations for the now famous organisation. This uh, was the first Geneva Convention. Uh, so that Red Cross workers could always be recognised, they created their own emblem, um, rather like a, a country has its own flag. Uh, they chose a Red Cross on a white background. The Red Cross operates in just about every country of the world, helping people caught up in famine and war, and the emblem is internationally recognised as a symbol of protection and neutrality. So concerned are the organisers of the Red Cross about the importance of their emblem that it is in fact protected by the laws of the Geneva Convention. Sometimes we find that the Red Cross has been used as a decorative symbol or to indicate first aid stations, but this is actually wrong because using the emblem for anything other than the international organisation is actually against the law. Even though we, uh, we tend to associate a Red Cross with hospitals and medical treatment, which in a way isn't surprising, in Australia, as in many countries, the recognised symbol for first aid and medical centres is not a red cross on a white background, but in fact a white cross on a green background. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Now, that's the global picture. But what about the local scene? Well, I work for the Australian Red Cross and my job is to train people in basic first aid, which is the name we give to the initial care of the sick or injured. There are four aims of first aid, known as the four Ps. They are, first and foremost, to preserve life. That is the number one objective of the first aider. <clears throat> then the second aim is to protect the victim, especially if the victim is actually unconscious. The third P is to prevent the condition from getting worse. And lastly, to promote recovery. So that's preserve life, protect the victim, prevent things from worsening and promote recovery. And we'll be looking at all of those in some detail during the course. As a trained first aider, you could be called upon at any time because accidents invariably happen when they're least expected. Unfortunately, by far the most common cause of injury in our country is on the road, where motor vehicle accidents account for 45% of all accidents. This is followed, and you may be surprised to hear this, by people falling, uh, falling out of windows or trees, falling off walls or simply falling over. Falls account for 21% of all accidents. Then there are accidents that happen at work where machinery is used. They account for 15% of the injuries. In Australia, water is unfortunately another big cause for concern. Each year, many people drown in swimming pools or at the beach, and 7% of accidental injuries are related to water. Another cause of injury is poisoning. Our houses are full of products and chemicals for cleaning the floor or killing insects in the garden. 
Small children are particularly vulnerable here because they cannot read the warnings on the bottles, and so poisoning accounts for 5% of injuries. Now, as a first aider, you need a basic understanding of what the human body consists of and how it works. So, we're going to start by looking at the organs. Now, this... Unit 9. The Driving Force. IELTS Test Practice. Section 2. You will hear an extract from a talk about cars. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Today, many people own a car, and cars have become a common sight around the world. But how did all this come about? In our report today, Jeremy Pemberton gives us a brief history of the motor car. Well, the first thing you should know is that no single individual was responsible for the invention of the car, or automobile as we call it in the States. The important thing to remember is that the car developed slowly over time, as hundreds of people sought to produce a motorized vehicle. This means that it's hard to say exactly when the car originated. The name automobile dates back to a drawing of a carriage mounted on four wheels that was designed by a 14th century Italian painter named Martini. The name that he gave it, automobile, is half Greek, auto meaning self, and half Latin, mobile meaning moving. Car, on the other hand, comes from a Latin word, carus, meaning cart or wagon. Add to that all the French words associated with cars, such as chauffeur, chassis, and garage, and you can start to see how complex the history is. It's believed that the first electric-powered road vehicle was built in about 1839 in Scotland by a man called Robert Anderson. The concept of an electrical engine that could start immediately and run quietly was very attractive at that time, as indeed it is now. The first designs were not very successful, though. Later, there were some improvements to these, and this led to the appearance of electric taxis on the streets of London in the late 1800s. But they, too, didn't last long, because electric batteries were still heavy, unreliable, and needed recharging after a short run. It's odd to think that we're just going back to solving some of these problems now. The first real automobiles were very much like motorized versions of horse-drawn vehicles and were referred to as horseless carriages. However, there is a much stronger link between cars and bicycles, Many pioneers in the car world were people who were experienced in manufacturing bicycles. In fact, the best place to buy a really fine car in the early 1900s was at the local bicycle shop. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. There is a common belief that the car is an American invention. But the American car inventors came on the scene relatively late, and while some succeeded, most failed. Then along came Henry Ford. Ford was born in 1863. His parents were farmers who had traveled to America from Ireland, but their son disliked the rural lifestyle, and in 1879, when he was 16 years old, he left home and walked to Detroit to find a job. 
He worked as an apprentice in a machine shop, and in his spare time, he built an internal combustion engine from plans he found in a magazine. It had bicycle wheels and was steered by a tiller. It had no brakes or reverse gear and was so noisy that the public hated it. Some years later, in 1896, he built his first vehicle that was bigger, more powerful, and much faster. It was called the quadricycle. This proved more popular. He was actually able to sell it and raise money for further experiments. During the next several years, Ford continued to refine his passenger vehicles. Finally, in 1903, he produced an automobile he was ready to market, and so he formed the Ford Motor Company. Ford first brought out the Model A, a small car with an eight-horsepower engine, which sold for eight hundred and fifty dollars. The next year, the Model B Ford was added. Which sold for two thousand dollars. In 1906, Ford added the Model K, which Ford lost money on because it was big and expensive. At this point, he decided to concentrate on a light, simple model that could be sold inexpensively. The new design was called the Model T, easy to operate and repair. Customers responded to the advantages of the Model T, and production increased. Gradually, Ford found a better, faster way to build cars, and in 1914 he opened the world's first auto assembly line. Suddenly, a car could be turned out in 93 minutes. By 1924, half of the cars in the world were Fords. The Model T sold for two hundred and ninety dollars, and profits piled up. Henry Ford did not create the automobile, but it was he who led the manufacturing revolution. He said he would ensure that just about everyone had a car. He kept his word, and life has never been the same since. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Unit Ten, the Silver Screen, Listening, Exercise Three. Hi Miranda, have you found a biography of Nicole Kidman? Yes,、yeah, Steve. Well, I've got a couple of things here that I took off the internet, so let's see if we can get down some basic details about her first. Okay. Well, we know that she's Australian. Well, that's her nationality, but look what it says here. She lived in Australia from the age of four, but she was born in Honolulu. Ah, that's interesting. That's in Hawaii, isn't it? So, how do you spell Honolulu? H O N O L U L U. Okay, got that. It says that she was、um, very interested in acting as a child. Although her parents were quite strict and worked in politics,、mm. she had to talk about politics at home. But her real love was acting, and she went to dancing classes from a young age. Okay, so I'll put those down as her childhood interests. Look here, it says the red-headed schoolgirl felt awkward as a child. Well, she's one point seven seven meters tall. Wow, that is tall. Um, what about her films? Well, her very first film was called Bush Christmas. When did she make that? I've never heard of it. In nineteen eighty-three, it was about some children looking for a stolen horse, I think. But that wasn't the film that made her famous around the world, was it? No, no, that was Dead Calm, the scary thriller about the boat. She was only nineteen when she made it, and she played the part of a woman in her thirties. It was very realistic.
I think we should jot down some notes about her marriage to Tom Cruise. How did she meet him? Well, she had a film festival in Japan when she heard that he wanted to meet her. He was starring in a romantic film and he wanted her to play the leading female role. Did she get it? Yeah, it's called Days of Thunder. Apparently she was worried about her height. She was taller than Tom Cruise. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't mind. He fell in love with her and they got married in 1990. Since then, she's just become more and more famous, hasn't she? Oh, yeah. Um, has she received any awards? Um, let's see. Yes, she received the Golden Globe Award for Best Actress in the thriller called To Die For. OK, we can note that down. Does she always star in the same type of film? No, no, she's performed in many different films. So, coming up to the present, she and Tom got divorced in 2001, didn't they? Yeah, and since then she's been doing some singing. Oh, and she's won another Golden Globe Award for her film Moulin Rouge. Unit 11. IELTS Speaking Test Model. Part 3. In Part 3, the examiner will ask you some questions related to the Part 2 topic. This candidate has just given a talk about a book that he enjoyed reading. We've been talking about a book you enjoyed, and I'd like to discuss with you one or two more general questions related to this. Let's consider, first of all, why people decide to write a book. What sort of reasons do you think people have for writing novels? Well, some people say that every one of us has a, a good book inside us, but I think there are many various reasons why people write. Perhaps they have a political message, but I think... The, the main thing is that you just feel that you have a story to tell and mm. perhaps you can't not write it. And some people have an ambition to write, don't oh, exactly. they? Exactly. Mm -hmm. What personal qualities do you think a writer needs to have? Well, I think the ability to um, be self-disciplined and to, to work alone, um, to be able to understand people, to get into the minds and hearts of, of other people. Mm. Do you think it's something that many people could do? No, I don't think mm. so. Otherwise, we would all write that book. Mm -hmm. Could you ever write a novel? I, um, I've had a go, but uh, it was a teenage experiment and uh, it's been long gathering dust. Yes. What about newspapers? Do you think newspapers are a good source of information? Providing you remain aware of the political inclinations of any particular newspaper, yes, I think it's um, a good way of learning about the news, etc. Yes. What other information do we get from newspapers? Um, well, um, sport, yes. uh, facts and things like that, weather, and um, it's good sort of editorial content, you know, gossip. Which type of paper do you think is best? I think um, certainly in England the uh, broadsheet newspapers are better than the tabloid mm. and um, I think you have to be aware again that they may have their own agenda but I think uh, a paper that's not uh, committed to any particular political cause. Right. You need a lot of time to read the newspaper, don't you? I mean, how often do you read the I, newspaper? I try to read the paper every day. Um, I don't always read the paper during the week, but the paper I love to buy is uh, on a Sunday because so much comes with it. A great culture section. You can read about the arts um, and catch up on all the things that have been going on during the week, the news review section, the sports section, money section. And I, I really enjoy the, the editorial on a Sunday. Do you think newspapers should contain illustrations? A lot of papers have cartoons in them and photographs. Is, is that helpful? Yes, I think so. I think um, certainly they can be a sort of a, a, a powerful way to convey a, a, a story, to draw your attention to something. Mm. Photographs possibly more than illustrations, although I do really enjoy cartoons. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's the end of the speaking test. Unit 12. Down to Earth. Speaking. Exercise 2. Listen and repeat. Prevent. Protect. Produce. 
Prevention Protection Production We need to prevent pollution. We should protect our planet. We need to produce more food. Unit 12. Speaking. Exercise 3. Listen and repeat. Involve. Conserve. Involvement. Conservation. Environment. We need to get involved. We need more community involvement. We must conserve our food. The key is conservation. Unit 12. Step up to IELTS listening. Section 3. To get going. Questions A, B and C. We've got John Partridge from the Sydney Zoo on the line to talk to us about what they're doing for the environment. Good morning, John. Good morning. Now, I understand that you've developed a new recycling process at the zoo. Can you tell us about it? Yes, certainly. Well, thanks to some innovative technology, all the wastewater, uh, that's the water used when we wash out the animals' cages, is being recycled. Can you tell us about the process? Well, we've developed a technique for removing all the bacteria and the disease-causing organisms from the wastewater by passing it through some plastic fibres. Is the water clean enough to drink? Uh, no, it's not being recycled as drinking water, but thanks to this technique, we're managing to reuse all the wastewater on the lawns and gardens. How much did this project cost to introduce? Uh, the total system cost $2.2 million, but we've already seen a saving of $70,000 in water costs since it was introduced. That's marvellous. Unit 12. Step up to IELTS listening. Section 3. Questions 1 to 3. If you've ever wondered what clean up the world was all about, now's your chance to find out. With us in the studio tonight is Melissa Young to tell us about the association. Melissa, welcome. Thank you. Tell us, where did the idea for clean up the world come from? Well, it's actually the brainchild of the people who started the movement known as Clean Up Australia, which has been going in Australia for some 10 years now. And what are the objectives of the organisation? Well, we have three main objectives. We felt we'd gained so much experience in Australia that we wanted to share experiences with people from other nations. Right. Secondly, we aim to bring people together, people from all corners of the globe, to undertake simple activities that will benefit their local environments. Right. So you want to share experiences and you want to bring people together at the local level. Yes, that's right. And thirdly, we want to create an international focus that raises the awareness of governments and industries about local environmental issues, but in particular issues of waste management. Unit 12. Step up to IELTS listening. Section 3. Question 4. Right. Well, those are all good objectives. Is it working? Yes, indeed it is. Since 1993, more than 40 million volunteers from over 120 countries have participated in Clean Up the World each year. Wow! And what does this actually involve in practical terms? There's a variety of activities, and these include health programmes, large-scale litter clean-ups. That's where a whole lot of people go out and clean up a park or a beach or something. Then there are public fundraising events, such as arranging rock concerts. Then there's introducing people to recycling systems, as well as school education programmes, 
And we also spend quite a bit of time talking to the government. Unit 12. Step up to IELTS listening. Section 3. Questions 5 to 10. Where did it all start? Well, as I think I mentioned, Clean Up the World was started in Australia and has been exported to more than 60% of the world's countries, stretching from Algeria to Bolivia and Greece to Vietnam, and we've just welcomed Armenia as our most recent member country to the campaign. Armenia, welcome aboard. Now, I know you're particularly concerned about waste management issues. Can you give us any statistics about the kind of waste issues that are confronting us globally? Sure. Well, for instance, it only takes three months for Americans to throw away enough aluminium... I suppose that's in the form of aluminium cans. Yes, enough aluminium to replace the entire US commercial aircraft fleet. Good heavens! That's phenomenal! Yes, that's a lot of cans. And here's another fact. Western Europe produces around 250 million car tyres a year, all of which have to be disposed of. Wow. Well, there are a lot of cars in Europe, obviously. And I suppose they'd get new tyres every second year or so. Yes, exactly. And then there's the plastic bag problem, which is huge. Here in Australia, we use six billion bags each year. Six billion? Yes, and less than 1% of them is being recycled. Really? And they're so bad for marine life, aren't they? They certainly are. Thousands of birds die from eating plastic bags each year. You know, research done in Hawaii found that 9 out of 10 albatross chicks that had died had swallowed some sort of plastic in one form or another. It's really sad, and it would be so easy to avoid this if people would at least throw them in rubbish bins instead of dropping them on the ground. Yes, that shouldn't be so hard. And here's one last fact for you. In the Gulf of Mexico, there's an area of 7,700 square miles of sea where absolutely no marine life exists other than bacteria. Melissa, thank you for coming on the programme today and for sharing all your facts and figures with us. And good luck with the Clean Up the World campaign. Unit 12. IELTS Test Practice. Section 3. You will hear two people discussing the life of an artist. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good evening and welcome to this week's edition of Radio Art Club. With us in the studio is Martin Wade, who is an art dealer, and he's here to talk to us about a man called John Gould. Welcome, Martin. Good evening. John Gould, if I'm right, was known as the Birdman. But who was he really? Well, Gould was a man of many parts. I suppose that first and foremost he was an artist. But he also had a keen eye for business, so we could also call him a businessman. And as well as that, he was a scientist. He studied birds, didn't he? Yes, that's correct. Right. So, we've got an artist, a businessman and a scientist all rolled into one. And why is he famous? Well, predominantly because he produced the greatest collection of drawings of Australian birds ever. Can you tell us about his life? What kind of a man was he? Mm. Now, let's see. He was born in England in 1804 and he lived for 76 years, so he had a relatively long and productive life. He had no formal education, and when he was a young man in the 1820s, he worked as a gardener in Kew Gardens in London. And then, because of his interest in animals, he was made curator of a museum, in fact, the Zoological Museum in London. 
Right. So he had quite a few interests. Absolutely. He and his wife together. They were both very interested in the discovery of new species of animals. So when did he visit Australia? Well, in 1838, Gould and his wife and their eldest son sailed from England, leaving their three youngest children behind with the grandparents. Gracious. <laughs> they travelled around extensively and, although they were only there for two years, Gould discovered many new species and he also named them. Yes, he played a significant role, didn't he? The family returned to England in August 1840 and took with them hundreds of specimens of animals for their great work, which was still to be produced. In fact, it took them eight years to produce the full work, which was completed in 1848 and published under the simple name of Birds of Australia. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Now, tell us about the drawings themselves. What process did he use to produce the prints of his drawings? He used a process known as lithography. Why did he choose this in particular? He chose it because he felt it was the best method he could use to accurately reproduce the fur and feathers of the animals. I see. Can you tell us briefly what it involves? Yes, certainly. Well, first of all, the drawing was made onto a flat slab of limestone. In order to do this, he used a wax crayon. You don't need any technical skill to do this, other than an ability to draw. <laughs> Which John Gould obviously had. Yes, that's right. Um, then, when he'd done the first drawing, he wet the stone and applied the ink. Where the stone was wet, the ink didn't stick. That's how he got the outline. Aha. Uh -huh. uh, then the inky picture was transferred to a piece of paper using a special printing press. Simple. <laughs> <laughs> Many of the prints are coloured. How did they do this? Well, it was a slow and laborious job. Each individual picture was coloured by hand. Right. That must have taken some patience, and I suppose that's why the result is so incredible. Yes. And how many prints did he produce? We think he produced about 250 of each, but there's no way of telling how many have survived the 150 years that have passed since then. Which is why the few examples that we have are so valuable, especially as many of the animals he drew are now extinct. That's absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Pleasure. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Unit 13. Safe as Houses. Step up to IELTS Listening. Section 4. Questions 1 to 6. Good morning, everyone. Now, today I'm going to talk to you about the history of building and architecture. No story is more interesting or impressive than the story of man's progress through the ages, and in particular the activities of human beings in the art of building. Let's have a look at this in some detail. In very early times, around 50,000 years ago, primitive humans lived in trees and caves where they found protection from wild beasts and shelter from bad weather. However, these natural shelters were pretty uncomfortable and so humans began to think of ways to construct more permanent dwellings, such as tents and huts. From these humble beginnings, a great variety of architectural styles gradually developed and we see how humans began to master constructional difficulties and at the same time
to achieve aesthetic desires. In other words, we see how they began to create buildings that were not only functional, but beautiful as well. Generally, architecture is concerned with the enclosing of space. Another way of saying this is that architecture is about creating a safe, healthy and pleasant space for the occupants, that is, for the people living and working there. A healthy place in which to live and also in which to work. There are three basic principles of architecture, and I'd like to run over these now. The first is the principle of function, that is, the purpose of the building in question. The second is the principle of construction. How is the building to be built or constructed? And the third, after construction, is artistic expression. In the course of time, communities of human beings settled in different parts of the world, and often they were able to create distinctive architectural styles. Styles which fulfilled the needs and desires of the people of those times. The creation of any architectural style depends upon four things. Firstly, the physical and mental state of the people. Are they happy? Are they at war with other tribes? That sort of thing. The second thing that leads to the creation of a style is their knowledge of how to actually construct a building. In other words, their ability to build. Thirdly, of course, you have to take into account the availability of materials with which to build. And lastly, and this is to my mind the most important, the climatic conditions will play a role. So, for instance, in a cold climate, the priority is to keep out the cold. And in a tropical climate, the aim is to stay cool. Unit 13. Step up to IELTS listening. Section 4. Questions 7 to 10. Listen to the next part of the lecture. I'd like to focus for a moment on the influence of climate on architecture. For example, in Greece, where there is a moderate rainfall and strong light, they adopted low-pitched roofs and few window openings. The ancient people of Egypt constructed buildings with flat roofs and small windows, as Egypt has a dry climate with bright light. However, in the colder climates of the Northern Hemisphere, countries like Sweden and Switzerland, they resorted to steep pitched roofs to allow the snow to run off. And for people living in a river delta where the land is prone to flooding, you will often find houses built on stilts to keep them clear of the water, places such as Vietnam. So, what materials are generally used? Well, stone, brick, concrete and wood have been the traditional building materials. But from the earliest times, stone has generally been chosen for important structures because of its durability and workability. The main types of construction are shown here in your handout. Now, have a look at the illustrations on page one. Firstly, we have the post and lintel made out of stone. The posts, or columns as they're also known, stand perpendicular to the ground. You can then lay another stone across the top of two columns and this is called a lintel or beam. However, for this type of construction to work, it's important that the columns are close to one another and that the space between the columns is not more than twice the width of the two columns. This structure was very popular in Egypt and Greece. Another very common technique in building was the arch. An arch can span a wider space than a post and lintel and is remarkably strong. The Romans were very keen on this form of structure and you will find Roman arches still standing today, as strong as when they were first built. At the top of the arch is a stone known as the keystone, which provides the arch with its strength. Roman arches were never pointed at the top. The pointed arch, known as the Gothic arch, came sometime later. These days, large buildings are usually built with reinforced concrete. And like the buildings of the ancient Greeks and Romans, this is... Unit 14. On the face of it. Listening. Exercise 1. 1. 
I did what Mr Winton suggested and I read all the right articles for that sociology assignment and then all I got was a grade D. I felt really let down after all my efforts. 2. Well, I've done heaps of preparation for the music presentation I'm doing tomorrow, but I still won't sleep tonight. I'll probably get up in the middle of the night and start practising. <laughs> Look at me, I I'm shaking at the thought. I'll be relieved when it's all over. 3. Tom and I are really looking forward to going away for a couple of weeks. We've both worked so hard this term, and now I just can't wait to get on that plane. 4. My neighbour's always been such a nice, pleasant, friendly person, always ready to lend a helping hand. And then one day I find out that he once spent three years in prison for robbery. I just couldn't believe it. 5. They turned up over an hour late, didn't ring or anything, didn't apologise when they arrived. I'm fed up. That's the last time I invite them round for dinner. They didn't say anything about the food, not even a thank you. And then they left as soon as they'd finished eating. I'm furious. 6. Every time I lend my car to my son, it comes back dirty. He says he only wants to drive it to college in the morning, but I think he's up to something else. I don't know where he's going with it, but there's something going on. Do you think I should follow him? Unit 14. Listening. Exercise 4. Have you ever smoked, Walid? No, I've never really wanted to. Hmm, I used to be a smoker, but I get really irritated now when I see people smoking in public places. Yes, it's a bit annoying in restaurants. Oh, I can't stand it anywhere, even outdoors. Really? It doesn't bother me. Don't you hate it at parties, people puffing in your face? Not particularly. Unit 14. Listening. Exercise 6. People always seem to get excited about a wedding. I guess they feel it's a happy occasion and it's a time when all the family can get together and celebrate. My parents don't worry about when I'll get married, but I know they think it's important and they'd be very upset if I decided never to do it. As for me, well, I'm not so sure. I'll get married if I find the right person and if he wants to get married but I'm not going to rush into it just to please my parents. I think I'm quite content on my own, and it wouldn't bother me if I stayed single. Unit 14. Listening. Exercise 9. Look at this topic. Mm -hmm. What do you remember most about your teenage life? I've never had an assignment quite like this before. No, I know what you mean. Normally we have to go and research something in the library. But this time we've got to produce something from our own personal experience. Still, I guess it's different. What are you going to write about, Hiba? That's a good question. All sorts of things happened to me when I was a teenager. I know that I argued with my brother a lot. I felt that my parents didn't understand me, mm. all that kind of stuff. But those stages are pretty standard, aren't they? Everyone goes through them. Mm. And it doesn't mean you are unhappy. Quite the opposite, in fact. Yes. I suppose we have to pick on something. Something that happened or an incident, perhaps, that changed us in some way, made us more independent. Mm. Mm. Can you think of one, Ahmed? There's one thing that stands out for me. What's that? Well, when I was about 16, my father decided that I needed to learn how to look after myself. So he had this crazy idea. <laughs> he, he didn't think it was crazy, of course. Even now he tells all his friends what an amazing thing he did and boasts about how it made me the man I am now. <laughs> Whereas for me... 
It was quite different. What happened? Uh, you won't believe this. Um, he drove me into the middle of the desert and left me there. <gasps> Told me I had to find my own way home. <laughs> it was like a test of courage and my ability to deal with a tricky situation. <laughs> you obviously found your way home. <laughs> yes, I did. I do feel quite good that I made it. <laughs> there, see. Si. I'm sure he would have come to find you if you hadn't turned up. I suppose so. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could have had a chance to prove myself like that. I'd never want to go through it again. Unit 15. As far as I can see. Speaking. Exercise 6. A. Do you think that scientists will successfully clone human beings one day? Yes, I think they will. From what I've read so far, they've already cloned a sheep. How do you think this will affect society? Well, as far as I can see, it's more a question of ethics than simple science. I think it could be quite harmful to society as a whole. But for medical purposes, I suppose it's OK. I think that's a very hard one to ask. B. Do you think we'll ever use computers to mark language speaking tests? Oh, gosh, I hope not. If they do, then I think students will feel concerned about fairness. The computer might make mistakes. I mean, how can you tell if a computer gets things wrong? Also, the exams would become very boring. So you'd prefer to talk to a human being? Oh, yes, definitely. C. Do you think we'll see robots doing medical operations? Yes, I think we will. From what I've read, robotics are already involved in eye operations, for instance. How would you feel about having machines performing routine tasks in a hospital? Fine. I think we'll see a greater reliance on machines in the future. They already have machines which take your blood pressure automatically every half an hour after an operation without a nurse having to come and do it. D. Do you think we'll see hotels being built in space in the foreseeable future? Oh, I'm not sure. Perhaps we will, if you count the International Space Station as a hotel. <laughs> How do you think this will affect the tourist industry? Well, I wouldn't see it as a huge threat at this stage. But we do already have a situation where wealthy individuals are prepared to pay enormous sums of money to travel to outer space without performing any useful function when they're there, just to say they've been there. So I suppose this is a form of holidays in space. It might increase in popularity. E. Do you believe that we'll develop drugs that lengthen our lifespan? Yes. I mean, any drug that's effective in curing us of disease or whatever is lengthening our lifespan, isn't it? But whether we actually want a drug that will make us live forever is another question. How would you feel about taking a drug that promised to do this? I don't think this will happen in the foreseeable future, but perhaps in 100 years or so. I think it would lead to all sorts of problems. Would anyone really want to live forever? I don't think so. Unit 15. IELTS Test Practice. Section 4. You will hear a talk given by a software engineer to a group of IT students. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 10.
Good morning, everyone. My name is John McNally, and as you know, I'm a software engineer. I work very close to Gatwick Airport in Britain, and at work we assemble flight simulators which are used to train aeroplane pilots. So, before any pilot is able to get in a real plane and fly it, they have to prove that they can operate all the controls in an aeroplane by flying in a computerised model. So, what does a flight simulator look like? Well, here's a picture of one. The simulator here is a model of a plane called an Airbus A320. As you can see, it's a large, almost round blob or box that moves on usually six legs to simulate the movement of an aircraft in the air. The legs tend to be driven by hydraulics, but there are some electric ones around. Either way, they operate to simulate the motion, the pitch and roll of the aircraft. The simulator can move up in the air or stretch, giving the trainee the feeling of flying upwards. At the very front, in the curved area here, is the mirror. And this is here so that images can be created that look exactly like an airport or landscape. Inside, the simulator tends to resemble an actual flight deck in an aircraft. And what happens is that generally the instructor stands or sits behind the trainee and positions the aircraft to any airport or any position on that airport using a touch screen. In this way, the instructor can train the pilot and there are many tests that the instructor can put the trainee through. He can fail an engine in flight, for example, to test the trainee's ability to react to malfunctions. How does it do this? Well, the simulator contains many computers, most of which have to communicate with each other. That's my job. And I work with many other software experts on this. We work in teams which vary in size, and each team has a specialist area but all the systems need to know what the other is doing. If the instructor wants to simulate a storm, for example, the flight experts need to know the strength of the winds and if there is any turbulence. At the same time, the navigation people need to know where the storm is, how far away, and place it on the pilot's navigation screen, and the engine experts need their information to ensure a safe passage. In fact, Landing an aircraft in rough weather is one of the most difficult things to do. And I've seen some very pale people step out of simulators. My time here, it can get very stormy in there. But trainees don't get into a simulator straight away. There are many different devices used in the training process. And this starts on a very simple level. One of the first things a trainee must know is how to input data into the flight management computer. The pilot on an aircraft enters information such as current airport, destination airport, as well as his route and other things such as the amount of fuel and aircraft weight. This procedure can be learned on a PC. Next, he may need to learn to manage the controls, for example, using the joystick to move up or down or left or right. He gets the feel of these controls and how they impact on the instruments. This can be learned on a fixed base simulator. Uh, that's one that doesn't move. Finally, he needs to take off, land and fly in the air during turbulence, etc. So for that, he needs a full flight simulator with motion. Trainee pilots vary in age and ability, and so the length of time it takes to train them also varies. Once a pilot has qualified on the simulator, they are entitled to fly an aircraft, but they are only called a first officer at this stage and must fly under an experienced captain, unless they are an experienced pilot who is simply retraining to fly a different aircraft type. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
That is the end of the listening test. At the end of the real test, you will have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet. Progress Test 1 The questions for this are in the teacher's book. Listening Section 1 You will hear a telephone conversation between a customer and a restaurant. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. you will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good evening, Red Dragon Restaurant. David speaking. Oh, hi. I was wondering if I could book a table for a group of people for next Saturday. I'm trying to organise a surprise party for someone. Certainly. Now let me see. What date is that? The woman says the booking is for next Saturday, so Saturday has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good evening. Red Dragon Restaurant. David speaking. Oh, hi. I was wondering if I could book a table for a group of people for next Saturday. I'm trying to organise a surprise party for someone. Certainly. Now let me see. What date is that? I think that's the 18th. Just let me have a look. The 18th of November. Looks fine. And how many people is that for? I... I think there'll be about 20 of us. 20? I see. It's quite a big party then. Yes. Perhaps more. It might be better to say 25. Okay. 25 people. I'm sure we can manage that. And what time would you like to come? About 20 past 7 or thereabouts. Let's say 7.30, shall we? We usually take bookings on the half hour. Oh, all right. 7.30. And can I have your name, please? Ah, uh, Jenny Fields. Uh, Fielder, did you say? No, Fields. That's... F-I-E-L-D-S. Right. And can I have a contact number for you? Sure. Uh, best if I give you my mobile number. That's 0414 No, double five two. Right. Got it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, we quite like a set menu, if that's possible, so that we know what it's going to cost us. Do you do that sort of thing? Yes, we do. What are the choices? Well, you've got a couple of choices with the set menu. We offer what we call our Golden Banquet for £25 per person. That includes a full seafood buffet. Eat as much as you like, that kind of thing, with tea or coffee. Uh, right, I see. Um, what else can you offer us? That's a bit expensive. 
Well, you could go for the Red Dragon Special at £18 per person. That gives you five main dishes to share, including, if you want it, our speciality, roast duck. But you need to let us know in advance if you want to order the duck. Oh, that sounds better. But £18 is still a little over our budget. We're students, you know. Do you offer a student discount? No. But I suppose, as there are 25 of you coming, we could do something for you. Um, uh, let's say uh, £15 each. How does that sound? Oh, uh, that sounds reasonable. Thank you. So, we'll see you on Saturday then? Yes. Oh, one last thing. What's the exact address so I can tell everyone how to get there? We're at 111 Church Road. That's next door to the bank on the corner of Barclay Street. 111 Church Road? Yes, that's right. We'll see you on Saturday. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Progress Test 2. The questions for this are in the teacher's book. Listening Section 2. You will hear an extract from a talk on a radio programme about food and drink. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Welcome to our regular piece on food and drink. Today's programme is about milk. People all over the world drink milk, but not all that milk comes from cows. In Tibet, for example, children drink yak's milk, and near the Arctic Circle, people get their milk from reindeer. Even buffalo milk is drunk in some countries. So, how did milk drinking begin? Well, the first animals that were milked, that we got our milk from, were sheep. That was about 11,500 years ago. About 2,000 years later, people started keeping goats and drinking their milk too. Then there were donkeys and mares, or female horses. In fact, cows were not used for their milk until 4,000 years ago, which is really quite recent when you think about it. We know this because rock drawings have been discovered in the Sahara Desert in Africa that show pictures of dairies with people milking cows and making cheese. Some old cheese has even been found in Egyptian tombs dating back 2,300 years. Imagine how that must have smelt. Pooh! Until the 1800s, milking animals and turning the milk into butter and cheese were jobs done mainly by women. This was because there were no machines to help with the process and, of course, it took a lot of time. The men were busy doing other things. However, Milking machines were invented in about 1830, and so soon after that, the cheese was made in special factories. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10.
Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. These days, yoghurt is a very popular milk product. But when did we start making yoghurt? Well, there is a legend, a very old story, that the first yoghurt was made by a nomad as he crossed the desert in Africa. Apparently, he set out with some milk in a bag made of sheep's stomach, which he attached to his camel. As he rode for quite a long time on his camel, the warmth of the sun turned the milk into thick, slightly sour yoghurt. It was probably very sour in those days, but now we add fruit and sugar to make it taste better. So, how much milk do we need? Generally speaking, growing children need to drink half a litre of milk a day in order to develop healthy teeth and bones. It doesn't matter whether this milk comes in the form of cheese, butter or yoghurt. You can even add flavouring to milk and it will still be good for you. But remember that most flavouring contains a lot of sugar, which can be bad for you. Dairy products, as they are known, are good for us and help keep us healthy. Though in many countries, it is more common to find soya milk products than dairy products. Soya milk is also very good for you. Ultimately, it is all a matter of taste. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Progress Test 3. The questions for this are in the teacher's book. Listening Section 3. You will hear a student asking a woman some questions about recycling. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Excuse me, I wonder if I could ask you a few questions. Um, I'm doing a small research project as part of my course on the environment. Yes, OK. What would you like to know? Well. We're looking into how much waste people in the town recycle. Do you recycle anything? Yes, um, I do. I, I've got these boxes here to put things in. Oh, that's great. I use this one here for things like old envelopes, letters, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I have to keep them separate from newspapers and magazines. They all go in this one. But I like to keep novels and children's books. I'm a bit of a collector in that respect, so I, I don't recycle anything like that. Mm -hmm. I suppose I should recycle glass and plastic bottles. That's pretty important, but I still haven't got round to it. <laughs> but I do put any dresses and jumpers that the children have grown out of in this box and um, footwear too. That's three products then that you recycle? Mm, I guess so. Um, have you only just started recycling, or have you been doing it for some time? Ooh, let me think. I think I've been doing it for about 12 months. No, I remember it was after I had that big clear-out in the study, and there were piles of old documents everywhere. That was six months ago. I thought this year I really must do something with this stuff, not just throw it out. OK. And we're also interested in the method that people use to do recycling. What do you mean? Well, uh, does the council come and collect it, or do you take it to a recycling centre? I wish it was collected. That would save me a lot of time. I take it to the depot in Stoneham, usually on a Monday, though sometimes I forget and then it piles up. <laughs> I usually take the stuff for the old man next door as well. 
He's 80, so it's almost impossible for him to do these things by himself. Mm, that's nice of you. All the more reason for getting the council to come and collect it. <laughs> but a lot of people around here don't bother, you know. They think there's no point because there isn't a proper system or anything. Mm. Do you feel there should be? Of course. Then I'd be more motivated to recycle other things like aluminium cans and tin, which are really just as important. I feel quite guilty about that. Before you hear the rest of the recording about the results of the research, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. So, how did your research go? Quite well. I've got some data to present in the tutorial. Oh, that's good. Let's have a look. I've done a couple of pie charts. The first one here shows mm. the ages of the people in our city who say they regularly recycle goods. It's quite interesting. I suppose families do the most recycling. Well, the majority of people are between 36 and 65, and then the old and the young seem to be equally bad at it. <laughs> Only 15% of young people recycle anything. <laughs> I think older people take a bit more time to get used to the idea, but younger people have no excuse. Mm. What about the things they recycle? When I was talking to people, they mentioned quite a few things, but overall... Well, as you can see on this chart, it's mainly glass and newspaper. Not surprising, really. Mm. I expected plastic to be quite significant, but instead it's clothes and then plastic. After that, there are things like aluminium cans and books. Hardly anyone recycles tin. It's the least popular. Mm. Maybe people don't eat as much tin food as they used to. Then I also went to the recycling depot and interviewed some of the people there so that I could find out what sort of things people usually take in. And the results there were... That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Progress Test 4. The questions for this are in the teacher's book. You will hear part of a lecture about oil recovery from the sea. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 10. Today we are most fortunate to have with us a guest lecturer from the United Arab Emirates who's been working with a team of colleagues at the university in Al Ain on oil recovery. He's here to talk to us today about this most valuable work. Thank you and good morning. I'm going to talk about the work we've been doing on oil recovery in an attempt to reduce the environmental damage caused by crude oil being spilt into the sea. 
This is mainly oil that has been spilt from oil tankers, and as I'm sure you're aware, this results in large oil slicks floating on the surface of the oceans, which are a huge hazard to wildlife and the environment generally. It is an alarming fact that for every thousand barrels of crude oil which is transported around the world, one of those barrels ends up in the sea. Our feeling here at the university was that this damage could be dramatically reduced if a recovery ship were able to follow behind and mop up the slick. And not only would the damage be greatly reduced, but at the end of the process, we would have a saleable product because we would be able to sell this oil. So we set ourselves the task of designing a ship that could capture oil floating on the surface of the ocean. Uh, I might add that people have been trying to do this for over 30 years, so far without any great success because they always run up against the same problem, how can you do this without collecting water? At present, the standard way of mopping up oil spills is by surrounding the slick, and then the salvage team gathers up the oil. But the effectiveness of this method depends on the type of oil, and you always get a certain amount of water in it. Um, and as well as that, there is further damage to the environment because any oil which is left behind has to be dealt with using chemicals, and these chemicals are harmful to the environment. We've been working on a prototype design, and we think we may be close to solving the major problem. So far, we have only produced a model, but we are pretty confident that it can work. Uh, here is a picture of the model. The model is to scale and is 60 centimeters in length from one end to the other. We floated it in a bath of water which contained a one liter slick of crude oil. In order to simulate the conditions that you'd find at sea, the bath was agitated to create waves. The ship floated over the oil and in only a couple of minutes it had recovered 99% of the oil slick. Yeah. Let's have a look at how the technique works. On board the ship, there is a large tank. Before the ship leaves the dock, this tank is filled with seawater. Uh, you can see that here in the diagram. When the ship approaches an oil slick, it opens a series of holes in the bottom of the hull to connect the water in the tank to the water outside. Now, as the ship moves along, its specially designed hull shape forces any oil it meets underneath the boat past the holes. The oil rises through the holes in the base of the ship, displacing the water in the tank. Because oil is less dense than seawater, the oil rises up through the holes to the top of the tank. Then, as it builds up in the tank, it gradually displaces the seawater until the tank contains nothing but oil. Then the holes are closed and the ship can return to dock to unload its cargo. There's been a, a fair bit of interest in our ship and we're working on building a larger version to test in open water. Obviously, that's going to require funding and a number of countries are interested. However, the real challenge now is of a practical nature. There are very few countries in the world that will permit oil to be spilt deliberately into the ocean so that they can test out new technologies in realistic conditions. Uh, this is a problem that we need to overcome in order to ensure the success of our project. Now, are there any questions? That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. At the end of the real test, you will have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet.